The title of this chapter is Caring for Clients with Disorders of the Liver, Gallbladder, and Pancreas. And this is chapter 47 in Timby. We are going to explain possible causes of jaundice, list common findings manifested by clients with cirrhosis, discuss common complications of cirrhosis, identify the modes of transmission of viral hepatitis, discuss nursing management for clients with medically or surgically treated liver disorder, identify factors that contribute to signs and symptoms of and medical treatments for cholecystitis, name techniques for gallbladder removal, summarize the nursing management of clients undergoing medical or surgical treatment of a gallbladder disorder, describe the treatment and nursing management of pancreatitis, describe the treatment of pancreatic carcinoma, and explain the nursing management of clients undergoing pancreatic surgery. We'll start with the liver. The liver metabolizes glucose, metabolizes proteins and fats, um, cleanses the body of drugs and toxins, chemicals, bacteria, and foreign elements. It converts glycogen to glucose. It regulates blood glucose by doing this. It stores vitamins and it forms and excretes bile and bilirubin and synthesizes factors for blood coagulation. Jaundice, it results from an abnormally high concentration of bilirubin in the blood. Visibly notable on the skin, oral mucous membranes, and especially the sclera. There's three forms of jaundice. First is hemolytic jaundice, the second is hematocellular, and the third is obstructive jaundice. The first one is hemolytic, and that means excessive destruction of red blood cells and results in an overproduction of bilirubin. The second is hematocellular, and this is liver disease where the damaged liver cells cannot clear the normal amounts of the bilirubin from the blood. And the third is obstructive jaundice, which is a blockage in the passage of bile between the liver and intestinal tract. And this is usually due to gallstones, inflammation, um, and disease processes. And basically what happens is that the bile gets reabsorbed into the blood and that's why you see it evidenced in the sclera and skin. Is the following statement true or false? Jaundice results from an abnormally low concentration of the pigment bilirubin in the blood. Cirrhosis is a degenerative liver disorder caused by cellular damage overall. This is caused by irreversibly damaged liver cells. Also, uh, consequences of damaged liver cells uh, includes absorption of fat. Soluble vit vitamins is not possible. Also, vitamin K is not uh, being synthesized for clotting. And also, fat-soluble uh, vitamins are not able to be absorbed. And um, the liver is not metabolizing estrogen anymore and um, also there's a fluid disruption and electrolyte imbalance and hypoproteinemia which causes ascites. There's also an impaired ability to again metabolize hormones and detoxify chemicals. The types of cirrhosis include alcoholic, post-necrotic, and biliary. Alcoholic is what it is, post-necrotic is cells destroyed secondarily to an infection such as hepatitis or chemical exposure. Um, there's also non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is a buildup of fat. Biliary uh, cirrhosis is caused by chronic biliary obstruction and infection. The bile ducts are blocked and can't drain the bile into this small intestine. So the signs and symptoms of cirrhosis will increase in severity as the disease progresses and they're categorized as either compensated or decompensated. So compensated cirrhosis is actually less severe and the signs and symptoms are a little bit more vague. As the disease progresses, it is referred to as decompensated cirrhosis. So signs and symptoms of decompensated cirrhosis are actually very pronounced and it indicates liver failure. 
So the client's history often will correlate with factors that predispose to cirrhosis. So chronic alcohol use, hepatitis, exposure to toxins. The client will typically experience chronic fatigue, anorexia, dyspepsia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea or constipation, and accompanying weight loss. So many clients report passing clay-colored or whitish stools as a result of no bile in the GI tract, and they also report dark or tea-colored urine from increased concentrations of urobilin. Uh, abdominal discomfort and shortness of breath breath are common complaints as a result of organ compression from the enlarged liver and a lot of patients will mention nosebleeds bleeding from the gums and easy bru uh, bruising and the skin may itch from uh, accumulated bile salts so if you guys look on page um, let me see if you guys look on page 833 at box 47-2 you're going to be able to see the clinical manifestations of cirrhosis. So we can see that in compensated, it, you have an intermittent mild fever, vascular uh, spiders, palmar erythema, unexplained epistaxis, ankle edema, vague morning indigestion, flatulent dyspepsia, abdominal pain, firm and large liver, and splenomegaly. So all these symptoms tend to be a little bit more vague, whereas if we look at decompensated, it's ascites, jaundice, weakness, muscle wasting, weight loss, continuous fever, clubbing of the fingers, and purpura. So that those kind of symptoms are significantly more severe than uh, the compensated. Uh, so a client with cirrhosis has an enlarged liver and sometimes an enlarged spleen, spleen causing the abdomen to appear distended. So ascites occurs late in the disease as a result of the liver dysfunction and portal obstruction. And some pa some patients will have peritonitis because of intestinal flora that migrates to the peritoneum. And the skin, sclera, or oral mucous membranes are jaundiced, which means they turn yellow. Edema may be present in the legs and feet, and you might see some vessels over the abdomen that can be dilated, and this is known as caput medicae. So gastric varices will usually occur because the blood flow through the liver is obstructed, and this leads to distended blood vessels throughout the entire GI tract, but most frequently in the upper GI tract. So these vessels are not intended for high pressures, and thus they're prone to rupture and bleeding. Now, because the dysfunctional liver cannot fully metabolize estrogen, men may present with gynecomastia, which means enlarged breasts, and testicular atrophy. Uh, palmar erythema, which are bright pink palms, and cutaneous spider angiomata, which are tiny spider-like blood vessels, may be visible. And these findings are also related to an inability to inactivate estrogen. Um, we, g we can also get vitamin deficiencies and anemia that occur secondary to impaired GI dysfunction, uh, poor dietary intake, and the body's inability to use or store vitamins, especially vitamins A, C, and K. Diagnostic findings for cirrhosis um, are using a liver biopsy, taking blood, having a CT, an MRI, and a radioisotope liver scan. The uh, liver scan demonstrates the liver's enlarged size, any nodular configurations, and distortion of blood flow. Medical and surgical management, there's no specific cure. Basically, you want to avoid further deterioration. Um, you need to give vitamins and nutritional supplements. You need to stop the alcohol intake. And for advanced liver disease, restrict protein intake and give lactulose administration to detoxify the ammonia that has now built up in the um, liver, in the blood. Treatment is a medicine called uro, or excuse me, ursodeoxycholic acid which is a medicine that promotes bioflow from the liver. Also potassium sparing diuretics decrease and also decrease the sodium intake. And you may have to give a platelet transfusion because there's, now there's a low platelet count because of the liver inflammation. And ultimately the patient will need a liver transplantation, transplantation if these other um, things don't work for them. 
nursing management for cirrhosis includes frequent uh, vital signs, uh, daily weights, strict INOs, and a measuring daily of abdominal girth, actually Q shift. Uh, for diet, you'd give small, uh, frequent meals. Um, the client response to drug therapy is very important because medications can't be cleared by the liver, so anything that that patient is taking as far as medicine can, can make them have adverse, if not toxic, effects. Um, you need to look for changes in mental status and any signs of GI bleeding because, again, you don't have the clotting factors working. Do not allow the patient to take non-prescription drugs. You need to teach the client about the liver disorder and refer them to support groups such as AA and drug programs. Um, they need to follow a treatment regimen, especially for home care if they're going to go home. Cirrhosis um, complications. Portal system hypertension results from cirrhosis. Basically, all veins in the stomach, the mesenteric veins from the intestines, the splenic veins from the spleen and the pancreas, and portal vein are all affected by this. These veins normally drain into and through the liver and out the hepatic veins to the inferior vena cava. What happens here is that um, there's a hypertension occurring in the liver where the blood then backs up in the portal system because the hepatic veins are compressed. This blood backs up in the venous pathways through the liver and blood vessels up through the um, esophagus, which causes potentially severe hemorrhaging and ultimately death if it is not treated and uh, watched very carefully. Um, the signs and symptoms of this portal hypertension could include GI bleeding, ascites, encephalopathy, which is the confusion and the change in level of consciousness in the brain and decreased platelets. Uh, the treatment is sodium restriction, drug therapy, surgical and non-surgical -surg shunts. For the esophageal varices, um, there's treatment for that I will talk about in a minute. Um, there's also hemorrhoids resulting from this portal hypertension and um, the abdominal uh, surface skin. It causes visible uh, veins, look like spider veins on the abdomen called Caput Medusae. And let's not forget about pain meds. Um, usually people have a lot of pain with ascites. Ascites is the hepatorenal syndrome that affects, again, the kidneys and the liver. It also causes, uh, or the cause for the ascites is the serum protein leaking into the peritoneal cavity. To treat that, they go in with a large needle and drain the peritoneal cavity. You can get as much as five to six liters a day from this. Um, you're also going to treat this with diet and drug therapy. Because of the ascites, you need to also watch for respiratory distress because of the pressure on the lungs. Again, the protein in the, um, that has been pulled into the um, peritoneal cavity needs to be addressed so that IV fluids will be given with albumin, which is a protein to pull the fluid and the protein back into the vascular space. So you want to watch INOs and blood pressure and give diuretics as needed. Hepatic encephalopathy is the CNS manifestation of liver failure, which can ultimately lead to coma and death. This is due to an increased ammonia level because of the liver not working properly, and the ammonia can cross the blood-brain barrier in the brain. CNS effects include disorientation, confusion, personality changes, and asterisks, which is a flapping tremor. You can see it in the book. Uh, basically, you push your hands against the patient's hands, and when you remove your hands, their hands will continue to flap um, without their control. Treatment includes elim eliminating dietary protein, also removing residual protein from any blood and the stomach, and depleting intestinal microorganisms. We use drugs, laxatives, and enema therapy to clean out the 
GI system. Because of the ascites and the hypertension uh, in the portal system, um, the kidneys also sense a low volume because, again, the volume of from the intravascular went into the peritoneum. The kidneys sense a low volume, which causes low blood pressure, so the kidneys respond by starting the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system where the body's going to hold on to sodium so that water stays in the body as well to raise the blood pressure. Also, um, because of the low blood pressure, the kidney um, also sends a signal to stop ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone, which keeps water in, again, and not eliminated as urine. As the fluid builds up in the uh, system, the abdomen um, ascites is getting, will get worse and will cause massive abdominal swelling. The pathophys and etiology of the um, hepatitis, which is another uh, liver infection um, caused by exposure to drugs or chemicals, alcohol abuse, or again, uh, viral infections such as hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, and G. As far as hepatitis A, um, that is transmitted by oral fecal route. Uh, sometimes people eat undercooked shellfish, which has been living in sewer water, um, and they get it that way. Other ways is again, uh, oral fecal. Um, Hepatitis B, C, and D is, um, well, B and C are transmitted by blood and sexual transmission. Hepatitis D can occur in people that have had or have hepatitis B, and there are tests to see if you are a carrier or not, uh, basically by um, looking at alpha fetoprotein results in the blood and ultrasounds. Other types of causes uh, for hepatitis is autoimmune disorders, uh, toxic dis um, because of being exposed to certain chemicals can cause hepatitis, and drug-induced hepatitis, which is a result of uh, possible anesthesia, antidepressant meds, and anticonvulsants. Which type of hepatitis is passed by the oral fecal route? That would be hepatitis A, you are correct. Also take note that um, hepatitis B, C, and D can be chronic and persistent. Hepatitis B and C uh, can cause uh, cancer. Assessment findings. Um, signs and symptoms are associated with four uh, phases, incubation, um, preecteric or prodromal, icteric, which is the third one, or post-icteric. The first one, incubation, the client is infectious and is beginning to have signs and symptoms, uh, but the pre-icteric is actually full-blown symptoms of nausea, vomiting, and nausea, vomiting, anorexia, fever, malaise, right upper quadrant pain, and the icteric is, um, again, severe symptoms, jaundice, itching, clay-colored stools, and post-icteric is the liver is still large, as before, but fatigue subsides and labs start to begin to return to normal. How do we diagnose the hepatitis? We use blood tests. Uh, we're looking for antibodies, also increased WBCs. We could take a liver biopsy. And also for blood work, we may see elevated ALTs, ASTs, and PT and PTT times would be longer because of the lack of clotting ability. Medical and surgical management includes uh, symptomatic, mainly, uh, management bed rest, IV fluids, vitamins, and anti-emetics because they're very nauseous. Um, also vitamins because the fat-soluble vitamins um, cannot be uh, stored in the liver. Um, medicine, you could give interferon and antivirals together. If none of those work, um, then we're talking about a liver transplantation and uh, people have to take immunosuppressives for the rest of their life. And sometimes the transplants don't succeed, as you know, and sometimes the fresh liver can actually develop hepatitis from um, previous hepatitis infection. Nursing management includes high protein, high calorie diets, 
rest, IV fluids, pain management, INOs. Liver tumors. This is an abnormal mass of cells in the liver. They can be benign or malignant. Um, if they start in the liver, it's called hepatoma, but usually the malignant seas of the liver cells came from the breast, lung, or GI tract. Benign liver tumors can be caused by tuberculosis, fungal, and parasitic infections. What you're going to see in your patient is jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, liver enlargement, you can actually palpate for that, and ascites. Diagnostic findings are the liver scans, ultrasounds, MRIs or CT scans, or a biopsy. Medical and surgical management, we can remove the lobe of the liver, we can inject uh, liquid nitrogen, cyrosurgery, into the tumor to freeze it, to kill it, or cyroablation, which is electric current injected into the tumors to heat and destroy the cells. Um, IV chemo and um, can be used for the malignant tumors directly into the hepatic artery. Peritoneum drugs can also be injected into the peritoneum to kill abnormal uh, metastatic cells. And then um, we do use radiation therapy to decrease the level of pain that the patient is having. Nursing management includes ensuring client safety and comfort, uh, especially pain meds and support ventilation. Because they have ascites, it's pressing on their lungs and it makes it very difficult to breathe. Plus, if they're in a lot of pain, they're not gonna be, breathe, be breathing well either. Um, you also want to do a lot of client and family teaching, um, support, give referrals, and um, especially for hospice, and begin the grieving process. Gallbladder disorders. This is the biliary system, which is, consists of the gallbladder and all the bile ducts. Here are some definitions for you to understand. Uh, the coleolithiasis are stones in the gallbladder. Cholelithiasis is stones located in the common bile duct. Cholecystitis is inflammation or infection of the gallbladder caused by formation of stones. It could be chronic or acute. The path uh, of physiology and etiology is um, that occurs mostly in women. It, it increases progressively with age, usually middle age. Um, any, the women with multiple pregnancies, anyone with diabetes and obesity, uh, anybody that's had bile stasis, there's dietary factors, um, usually a high um, incidence of intake of fat or poor diet or both, um, anyone having uh, gallstones and, um, or their gallbladder inflamed or distended with bile. Your assessment findings are going to be what they call biliary, biliary colic, which is right upper quadrant pain that radiates to the back and right shoulder, nausea, vomiting, pain after eating high fat meals, fever, and vomiting. Um, the discomfort is a result of inflammation and spasms of the gallbladder. Digestion problems from reduced or absent bile is included, swelling of the gallbladder and necrotic gallbladder all contribute to the pain. Diagnostic, diagnostic findings include the coleocystography, a CT scan, an ultrasound, radionuclide imaging, a test called PTCA, which distinguishes between jaundice caused by the liver versus the gallbladder, and a test called ERCP, which actually locates stones in the common bile duct. Medical and surgical management include an NG tube, antibiotics, uh, parenteral fluids, a low-fat diet, lithotripsy, which is a shock waves that disintegrate the gallstones, sphincterotomy, which is um, uh, dilation or opening of the sphincter called ODI, the sphincter of ODI, O-D-D-I. And this is located where the common bile duct joins the jejunum. Using an endoscopy scope, the, uh, they insert the, the scope and it has a little basket on the end that catches the stone and they can remove it. Next we have uh, pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas located in the upper abdomen. Um, this can be acute or chronic. Acute pancreatitis in its mild form, the person is still very, very ill. It's an inflammation and swelling of the pancreas. 
the person can return to normal, but it takes about six months. The severe form is when there's enzyme enzymatic digestion of the pancreas itself, um, forming necrotic tissue, and there's local and systemic complications. 10% of people diagnosed with this will die. Um, patho and etiology is that there's an auto digestion occurring caused by inflammation and reflux of the bile of the duodenal contents into the pancreatic duct. It swells, the duct swells and blocks bicarb, which is normally released, and the enzymes accumulate and auto digest the pancreas. Acute. Pancreatitis includes signs and symptoms include severe mid-abdominal to upper abdominal pain, radiating to the sides and the back, vomiting, also frothy and foul-smelling stools, um, a sign of steatorrhea, which is increased fat in the stool, um, jaundice, you'll find the bowel sounds are diminished or absent, the belly is tender to palpation, the patient has hypotension, which is hypovolemia due to large amounts of protein-rich fluid um, going into the tissues and the peritoneal cavity being pulled out of the vascular um, system. A uh, patient will have fever, tachycardia, the breathing will be shallow due to pain, and if this is a severe pancreatitis, you may see bruising around the umbilicus or on the flanks, which is the backside. For diagnostic findings, you're going to see on lab values, elevated serum and urine, urine amylase, lipase, and liver enzyme levels. If the common bile duct is obstructed, you're going to see high bilirubin levels. You'll also see elevated blood glucose levels and white blood cell counts will be high. You'll have a low serum electrolyte level, especially with calcium, magnesium, and potassium. The CT scan can show pancreatic edema and necrotic uh, tissue, and the endoscopy can show um, pancreas cysts, abscess, pseudocysts, which are capsules filled with blood, pus, enzymes, and tissue debris. Remember, the pancreas is responsible for releasing, releasing insulin. Medical and surgical management of acute pancreatitis includes relieving pain, reducing those pancreatic secretions, restoring fluid and electrolyte losses, uh, controlling um, or preventing respiratory distress syndrome, um, also preventing renal tubular necro necrosis and bleeding abnormalities. You're gonna treat systemic complications from any of those. You're gonna insert an NG. This is for the nausea, vomiting, and abdominal distension. You're gonna give fluids to hydrate albumin to replace the protein in the vascular system. You're gonna give diuretics to get rid of the fluid in the belly, which is called ascites. You're gonna give enteral feedings for nutrition. And again, pain management is gonna include opioids such as uh, morphine sulfate, fentanyl, hydromorphone. You're gonna give um, Pepsid, which is an H2 antagonist. PPIs, proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec to decrease gastric acid and decrease pancreatic activity. IV antibiotic therapy will also be given to treat local abscesses or treat systemic sepsis. Uh, diet therapy will include um, clear liquids, advanced to low fat is tolerated, no stimulants uh, like no coffee. Um, you're going to give pancreatic enzymes now to help digest the food. And that is a replacement for the um, amylase, lipase, and protease enzymes that are going to be missing. Um, sump drains also may be placed to drain debris. Nursing management of the acute pancreatitis includes monitoring for life-threatening change changes, including alcohol withdrawal problems, um, and any CNS issues, and any bleeding issues. You want to perform the prescribed treatment measures, um, NG tubes, IV fluids, TPN, um, vital signs frequently, glucose level checks frequently. Remember, you don't have the insulin. Uh, frequent pain meds, strict INOs, and uh, keeping an eye on your electrolytes uh, because the imbalances can cause heart dysrhythmias and respiratory issues also need to be reported if the person cannot breathe well. So let's talk about chronic pancreatitis. So chronic pancreatitis is a prolonged and progressive inflammation of the pancreas 
and with gradual destruction of the pancreatic tissue. So fibrous tissue will cause increased pressure within the pancreas, which eventually will lead to the obstruction of the pancreatic and biliary ducts. And in most cases, alcohol consumption is usually the cause of chronic pancreatitis. It'll lead to edema of the duodenum and it decreases the tone of the sphincter of odi. So eventually, the duodenal contents will then move into the pancreatic duct and other causes can uh, include hereditary, hereditary predisposition, hyperparathyroidism, hypertriglyceridemia, autoimmune pancreatitis, trauma, and anatomic abnormalities. Um, in about 20% of the cases, though, uh, no particular cause is identifiable. So in it being chronic, the gland undergoes fibrotic scarring from the recurring inflammation and the pancreas will harden and exocrine and endocrine functions are either partly or completely lost as pancreatic, pancreatic tissue is destroyed. So when we're talking about the assessment findings and the signs and symptoms, in chronic pancreatitis, the client has severe to persistent pain, weight loss, digestive disturbances such as flatulence, vomiting, and diarrhea. And if the if the pseudocysts form, they'll contribute to the severity of the symptoms by putting pressure on adjacent organs or by rupturing. And if secondary diabetes develops, the patient may experience increased appetite, thirst, and urination. Um, a firm mass uh, might also be palpated in the upper left quadrant. Um, you might find that the urine is dark and their stools might be light colored and really foul smelling and you might be able to see some fatty streaks that appear in the stool as well. So with the loss of plasma proteins from the blood, you can also see that peripheral edema and ascites might develop. Um, in finding chronic pancreatitis in diagnostics, we're going to find abnormal lab findings, um, and this is they're going to be the same for chronic pancreatitis as well as it being acute. So we're going to want to do CT scans, MRI, uh, ultrasounds, and ERCP studies of the pancreas, which show diagnostic results similar to those clients in acute pancreatitis. So um, we can also do a glucose tolerance test, and that will show the impaired ability to metabolize carbs because of malfunctioning endocrine cells. Medical and surgical management of chronic pancreatitis includes abstinence from alcohol, caffeine, and pepper, fat-free diet, and correction of associated biliary tract disease. Drug therapy includes opioids such as meperidine, narcotics, non and non-opioid methods, and the um, prescription of pancreatic enzymes, which is a mixture of amylase, lipase, and protease that help break down fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Normal function of the pancreas uh, secretes eight cups of pancreatic juice into the duodenum to digest these things every day. Uh, helps with digestion of bicarb also to, um, or excuse me, digestion and gives bicarb to neutralize stomach acid as it enters the small intestine. Another treatment would be partial or total pancreatectomy. Um, the nursing process, as far as this goes, is alcohol withdrawal, um, assessments, diagnosis, and sudden changes in LOC. Um, the evaluation of expected outcomes involves um, diet um, tolerance, uh, enzymes, obviously uh, medications that the patient's taking on a regular basis, um, and being cooperative, and insulin for the blood sugars being totally out of control. Next, we discuss pancreatic cancer. This can occur in the pancreas in the gland's head, body, or tail. This is an accumulation of usually of malignant cells. It's a consequence of tumor development. It usually doesn't have symptoms until late in the disease, uh, which causes a high um, um, rate of death. Um, factors that correlate with pancreatic cancer include diabetes mellitus, a high-fat diet, chronic exposure to petrochemicals, cigarette smoking, 
high ingestion of coffee, but in particular decaffeinated coffee, and excess body weight and a family history. Diagnostic findings include an abdominal ultrasound, a CT scan, and a biopsy of the pancreas. Medical and surgical management of the pancreatic cancer includes a radical pancreatoduodenectomy, which is also called a Whipple procedure on page 860 in your book. Um, basically, they remove the head of the pancreas, they resect the duodenum and the stomach, they redirect the flow of secretions from the stomach, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. It's a big surgery. Cholecystogenostomy is the rerouting of pancreatic and biliary drainage. Um, inoperable tumors require radiation or chemotherapy with 5-flora or so. Nursing management is preparing for death. It's, this is a terminal uh, diagnosis and also IVs, TPN, and NGs as needed. Is the following statement true or false? Radical pancreatic duodenotomy ectomy is the removal of the head of the pancreas with a resection of the duodenum in the stomach and redirection of the flow of secretions from the stomach, gallbladder, and pancreas.